Ali Forth. Today, I'm here to give you the assurance that I have not forgotten you. If we want to see the new evangelization become more than just jargon, if we want to see it grow legs and gain traction and change the world, we have got to take seriously our responsibilities as husbands and fathers and especially as sons of God. I want to propose to you then that something that our world is desperately in need of in the midst of this crisis is Catholic Christian masculinity. If you want to be a good father, then bring your children to confession with you. I can't get there unless I become a man of ascesis, a man of asceticism, a man of training. A man not doing penance, a man not disciplined, is not a man. You guys have up your game. You know what, guys, I gotta say, I, I love this the concept of the man show. Warning, the Catholic man show is about to begin. Welcome to the Catholic Man Show. We're on the Lord's team, the winning side. So raise your glass. Adam Minahan here with David Niles. We have no one. We have no Jim. We have no one here but us. Just us. This evening, it's a. Uh, it's been a good day this far. Yes. Um, today is. It's a beautiful day today. Beautiful day in, in, in Oklahoma. Today is also um, the anniversary, the death anniversary of my grandfather. Oh. Or the birthday of his eternal meeting. rest to him. Yes. Um, so if you could, in your charity, offer up a prayer for Jerry Minahan, uh, my, my my grandfather. He he was. One of, or he was the first. He and my grandmother were the first ones to get married in the Catholic Church in Seminole. No kidding. Mm-hmm. That's cool. In uh, Sem- Seminole, Oklahoma. So they were the first couple to get married in Seminole, Oklahoma. In, in that the ca- church. In the Catholic Church, which is cool. pretty cool. That is cool. Um, I was at a, um, a, a graveyard cemetery. cemetery? Thank the, you. Yes. Yep. That's the word. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's. I'm actually very tired. Uh, yeah. Uh, but <laughs> well, we had a late night if, last last night. Like this, if there's a candidate for like having a day where you struggle with your words, today's the day. Today's gonna be one uh, of those days. Well, like buckle up, guys. This will be fun for you. Yeah. But I I ran into a Minahan tombstone. In which there Springs. are not a lot of Minahans. No. In Tulsa, Oklahoma. No. No, there's not. Uh, there there is Minahans in Sand Springs. I don't know how they're they're related or if how we are yeah um, but yeah minahan is an irish name and means little monk i dig it which is kind of cool totally so but yeah last night we uh, had our traditional uh whiskey baby bottle mm-hmm. so one of the things that we have started we started years and well mm. 10 years ago yeah um we had yeah a decade ago that's weird it's happening bro we are getting old uh, is that you and, and me and, and Juan, uh, you know, whenever we have a child, we get together to, in celebration of in Thanksgiving for life. We get together and we buy a nice whiskey bottle, like a whiskey. Mm-hmm. And, and one that we normally wouldn't afford, but if we, you throw in money, he throws in money, which by the way, you owe me money. I was about to say, so I, I actually meant to bring you money today, <laughs> but I forgot. <laughs> um, but, you know, if everybody throws in money, then all of a sudden you can buy a nicer bottle of yeah, whiskey. Yeah, yeah. And so last night, uh, we had the Red Breast Irish Whiskey. Mm -hmm. Um, It was in... uh, Sherry. Aged in uh, PX Sherry casks, Mm -hmm. yes. And it was just delicious. It was so good. It was so good. And, you know, so I I got the Irish Whiskey because Minahan and John... We found out that John was was conceived, that Haley was pregnant, in Ireland uh, on our uh, uh, wedding anniversary. So... He so wasn't anyway, conceived in Ireland. No, we found out that he was. We found out already, that she was pregnant. He, he had already been conceived. While you were in Ireland. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's really cool. So that that's, is, why, yeah, that's why that I picked cool. the Irish whiskey. So anyway, we stayed up. It's a great tradition. You know, we're, we are getting old. Uh, we're, you know, knocking on 40 here in a couple years. And so we I stayed mean, up. you are. I am. Yeah. You're, you're still. I mean, I'm like, like way younger than you. Yeah. 
So we stayed up way later than what we, I think we stayed up till one o'clock. Oh, dude, I didn't go to bed till two. When I got home, I had farm chores. Oh, awesome! If you can imagine that, <laughs> that's awesome. Because I got sick piglets still. Do you? Yeah, and so I was having to go out there to take care of. Them. I have I have um, one one of them in isolation, and so I, I need to. He's not eating, so, so to, I like, need to like hand go out him. there and feed him. Um, I did I did get some penicillin for him today. Uh, which you know you can just like go to the farmers co-op and you can buy like a huge bottle of penicillin. It it says like not for human not for human use mm-hmm. and you shouldn't use it because mm-hmm. that's what it says in the bottle. Your doctor is gonna definitely agree. That being said, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's the same. <laughs> you shouldn't use it. Right. Don't. Not- don't this go to not, the farmer's co-op. This is not an ivermectin. And, and get yourself some, think that like, I'm going to go get some penicillin for me. Okay, right. don't do that. Now, if it's like an apocalyptic scenario, be like, totally, that's going to save your life. But it isn't. <laughs> it, the thing is, it isn't. Don't do that. You can like go and get regular human medicine at the human, the human medicine store. Pharmacy. Yep, as opposed to the animal store, so... But anyway, uh, I am giving. I did give him. Some it's pe- so quality, dude. A Is penicillin it? shot today. Good. He's got like this weird kind of arthritis that the pigs get, uh, and he's been like really. <laughs> this piglet, his name's um, Alfred. He's been really circling the drain, and I am really hoping <laughs> that he pulls. He pulls through one uh, way or the other. But it, it's a. I found out. I feel like I'd have definitively diagnosed his condition. Um, it's he's he's joint ill that's actually the name of it there's a scientific name too but farmers don't use it so it's bacteria should should take care of it we'll see and by next week our next week's episode i'll let you know okay good so this evening we're having a uh, smoke wagon malted straight rye whiskey our, our friends over there at smoke smoke wagon in um, las vegas nevada Go follow them on on Instagram. They're a great follow. Uh, they actually sent us a bottle like years ago. They sent us a bottle. Yeah. Do you remember this? Yeah, I do. And we loved the bottle because it's you know it's very ornate. It's it's like a it's nice got Latin on it. Yeah, it's a very nice uh, uh, what does bottle. Bibamos moriendum est mean? I do not know. I don't know what moriendum means. Uh, Bibamos is like drink. Bibere means to drink. So, so probably bi- in, in memory, like uh, I, so it's something about like in. Drinking memory of, I don't I don't know what morienda means in the in the break, we'll we'll, we'll look it up, it up okay. and then and then we'll let. But anyway, let so know. that's what we're having this evening. Uh, it is like I said, a straight straight rye. It is, uh, uh, let's see, fifty one percent rye, forty nine percent malted barley, and has a sweet and creamy flavor with notes of caramel, cereal, and and malt. The rye the rye gives you a cinnamon spice, black pepper, and smoky note at the end. It definitely does. So we're on the Lord's team. The winning side. So raise your glass. And cheers to Jesus. Cheers. It's also strong. Uh, it, like, it's almost 59% alcohol. Okay. Um, so be careful. Yeah. Mmm. Well, that is it's very, good. very flavorful. Has a lot of flavor. Wow. I don't drink a lot of rye. I, I think we, I probably say that every time we have one. Um just delicious but there is there's a lot kind of a natural complexity that i think you get with a rye I mean, they, that is, that they, is really they also tend to be on the hot side because mm-hmm. of that rye flavor and this one is but um it's not like hot in a bad way it's just hot in a rye way hmm. the it's rye way the rye way yeah man that is really nice um yeah i, re- I really really like that so anyway, go smoke wagon. This is, go follow them on Instagram. You Are can, all of their is all of their stuff rye? No, no, they have okay. They have bourbons. They do other ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Very good. go check them out. Anyway, so uh, what what else has been going on in the in the Niles household? Man, do you just want to hear more farm stories? Is that no? I can tell you more farm stories, but but that's all you got for right how, now. How did the how the girls? They're doing great. Yeah, yeah. They're uh, excited to be like approaching the end of. The semester, mm-hmm. you know, they can they can sense it sort of. So I told you this the other uh, the other night, but um, well, I'll share it on the on the show. It's one of the things that we took up as a family during Lent, 
is praying Compline together as a family. Mm. And you know, so half the family goes on one side, the other half goes on the other, and we, kind of, we go back and do forth. Do you chant it? We do not. We, we're taking baby steps. Because like, uh-huh. the first couple of times was pretty pretty rough. Yeah. It was pretty rough sledding. Because there's times where like there's a leader, and then there's response, and then there's like this side and, and then versus, this side. Yeah, exactly. And so like you have to know which... Honestly, it is a little bit confusing. The it, first time I tried tough. to pray the Liturgy of the Hours, it wasn't Compline. It was probably morning prayer or something, or night prayer. Um, I was very frustrated, and in fact, that like I, I kind of got mad at how it just it didn't make sense to me. The book I had didn't clearly, you know, explain. And it. I was the I think it's like I was also the only one who didn't know what, what to, to do, do. and so Which it's like all... embarrassing. And you know, yep. Honestly, it for a couple of years it put a a bad taste in my mouth for the for praying the liturgy, the liturgy of the hours, which I've since realized is silly and foolish that the liturgy of the hours is a beautiful prayer right Mm -hmm. uh so anyway but it is if you don't know what to do and especially in a group if you're by yourself it doesn't matter you just read 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 the whole thing you just read all of it and um but yeah in a group and it's different like oh if there's two of you you're gonna do it a certain way but if there's three or more of you now you can like do the parts Right, like what kind of what you're talking about, a leader, and then also this side and that side. Right. So it's been really, it's been really great. What, what, what I did is I bought every family member of the book from Clear Creek. Like, so there's a, here's a book of it actually yeah. has Prime and Compline together. Okay. So everybody has their own book, and it just kind of starts the prayer off well because everybody has their own. We're doing this all together, and we we did this evening even, and it was just like so beautiful. To do together as Wonderful. a family. That's so a great idea. Hopefully, we'll we'll continue this. Great after, idea, bro. After Lent as well. So we'll be right back. All right. Let's see. You gonna try to look up? Yeah. It's kind of hard to read. The light in here is. Well, not the light's very good. not very good. Here, be vamos. There, I'll make it easier for you. Be... Why are you sending that to me as a text? Oh gosh, I thought I was doing a search. Man, it's just you're, man, you're I'm not, telling you, not firing <laughs> in all cylinders today. Oh, look, I just typed in. There it is. It it knows. Well, it's, well, our phones do listen to us, basically. Let us drink, for we must die. Very fitting for today's episode. It is indeed. I see. I thought like maybe, in memory. That's why I said in memory because like, no, it's like more t- more uh, momentum mori. Yeah, like um, yeah, moriendum is like mortus. Right. Uh, Morbid. Yeah, exactly. Mortuary. Mm-hmm. Let us drink, for we must die. And it's weird, like the endings on those. If David Dean were here, he could tell us like what case and tense that is are, because that's kind of a weird phrase. You know, it's not like you have a subject, direct object, you know. Anyway. What declension is it? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. (laughs) Welcome back to the Catholic Man Show. I'm David Niles, here with Adam Minahan. We're drinking Smoke Wagon. Rye whiskey, straight rye whiskey. We looked it up. Bibamus morientum est means, let us drink, for we must die. We're totally going to die, so let's have a drink. Nice. Which is really fitting for the topic today, because we're going to be actually talking about uh, preparation for death. About dying. Which is... Uh, uh, coincidental. We did not plan plan that out, but it sometimes it just works out. The that Lord way. wills. Hey, did you know that Deus I, Volt? I heard somebody was saying on a podcast not too long ago that the younger generations are are not drinking like hardly at all. Really? Yeah. That, that basically our generation is kind of like the last drinkers. Is what they're saying. Interesting. I did. I did not know this. I didn't know. I didn't know that either. But apparently, some. Of what the are younger, they doing? Some of the younger generations are. Or not, you know, drinking as much, and I, I'm not saying that like oh we're just heavy drinkers, but like 
when they go out to social settings, it's not about like, hey, let's go grab a beer. I guess it's like let's go grab a coffee hmm. or tea or I don't know. Yeah, okay, I mean I like those things too. Yeah. Not as I just as beer. I just found out like just heard that it's like wow. That's well, yeah, very I wonder what that means. I wonder like what the cause of that is. Like, are they? Re- are they I think rejecting it, it, something? Or probably are they like, like for health, I think. Maybe. Would be my guess. There are also the younger generations, they tend to imbibe in medical... Uh, marijuana. Marijuana a lot, which just this week, there was a big study that came out, but like basically, if you smoke even like once a month, your risk for heart failure like or heart disease skyrockets. And, and it doesn't actually matter if you smoke it or like you Ingest use edibles it. like uh thc is terrible for your heart no kidding and they've just this is the kind of thing they've never studied before because thc was a schedule three drug right or schedule one or schedule one yeah whichever the highest schedule, schedule like one the most rigorous and so you can't the the definition of those is that you, the, these are drugs have no medical use and therefore cannot be studied you mm-hmm. can't do clinical trials on so they're ju- i guess I think it still is still schedule one, so I'm not really sure how they're doing this study, but um, it was a fairly, like, it's been kind of big news. Hmm. Because everybody thought and has been told, like, oh, it has no harmful side, of, you know, like, right. it's not bad for you. Right. Turns out it's actually very bad for you. Hmm. And it's like, you're also, your risk of stroke goes way up. No kidding. Yeah. Didn't know that either. So, there you go. That's, we're talking about death. That could be why you die. That would not be fun. And you, yeah. Not, not a good hope, way to go. Hope you're ready. So we're pulling uh, this evening. It's called, the book is called Preparation of Death, Considerations for uh, on Eternal Truths. Considerations on Eternal Truths. It's by St. Alphonsus Liguori, who I just don't feel like gets enough credit. Dude, I love him. He's so good. He's so he's, 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 he's kind of dense. Uh, he also is very bold. Yeah, that he is. You're right. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily that he's, I wouldn't say he's dense, like, uh, Aquinas dense, no, no, but no, like, no. He's, but sometimes he's like, he can go over your head. I he think can go, he can get into the weeds a little bit, but yeah. he's he's very uh, bold in his statements because he's a doctor of the church. Mm-hmm. I believe, I believe, man, it's it was either somebody can can correct me, but it's either like uh, Pius the the twelfth. I think Pius the twelfth made him a doctor of the church, or or maybe. The night. Anyway, I do not even pretend to know. But he's he's out of the 1700s. He's the founder of the Redemptorist, Redemp, Redemption, Redemptorists. There okay. it is, Redemptorists uh-huh. uh, order. And he's considered like the moral theologian, like yeah, the the moral doctor of the church, so yeah. to speak. He's also uh, a patron of of the lay people because of his productivity, because of how productive he was as a. Uh, just as as that's, a person, that's interesting, right? <laughs> the, there's a an <laughs> something implicit in that that wow, this priest gets a lot done. He's sort of like a layperson, you know, as if like priests typically don't get much done. You know, like isn't that a little bit kind of that's kind of funny? I think it's a little interesting. Yeah, yeah. But he's so he's he's written a he wrote a whole lot in his lifetime. However, not all of his writings have been translated into english but they're they're making their way through isn't fact, that isn't that crazy that like yes. he's a doctor of the church it's not like he's from the 300s you know right it's 1700s like yeah. we're not talking that long ago yeah where like it's it's reasonable that his some of his writings would have been translated into english at the time you know like at publication like oh let's go ahead and put this in i mean that's it would have been a reasonable thing but well, and actually, you know, my brother-in-law, I've mentioned this on the show before. Worth saying again. Is, uh, I don't know what you would call it, but like the official publisher of the English translation of his work on um, confession, mm-hmm. which is one of the major, like his most important writings that, that was like contributed to his becoming a doctor of the church. Um, so my brother-in-law, Father Sean O'Brien, did not translate it. There was a... Some doctors, you know, doc, doctoral people in the 70s who did it, who translated it, and, like, never could get it published. And so um, he found, like, their PDF on the Internet mm-hmm. and said, hey, can I 
you know, can I self publish this on Amazon? Mm-hmm. And they're like, sure, go for it. We've been trying to get it for you done for years and nobody. And I think they're just too old to know about self publishing. Okay. Cause they were, you know, doing this a long time ago. So yeah, he, he just downloaded their PDF, sent it to Amazon and now you can buy it. I, it's super, super cheap. He priced it so he makes as little money as is allowed. I think he gets like a penny per book every time someone buys the book. Do you remember what it's called? I don't. Okay. Hmm. I can text him. But um, yeah, so so we're pulling from this, and I thought this was just a good thing to be thinking about as we're entering into the Passion Tide. You know, in in two weeks, Passion Sundays in two weeks. Yeah. Uh, we're entering into Holy Week here very soon, and so throughout this is the time of year this is the time in lent that thing or if you're doing exodus 90 or lent with exodus you know it's this time Uh it's the time period where man it's just dragging and you're you're kind of waning a little bit you're 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 kind of like wavering like oh maybe i'll relax this maybe you know you kind of the the noonday devil so to speak kind of creeps in yeah and you start playing mental games with yourself like oh if i give up this like well uh, I'll just do it this time, you know, and, and you just kind of, uh, you kind of get weak and like, yeah. so, but this is the time to really double down. This is the time to, to re commit yourself to, to these things. Because again, the reason why we're going through this is to die to self so that way we can love Christ even more. Mm-hmm. Right. And because the whole end of man is unity with God. This is the, this is like the purpose of man. This is the purpose of your soul is to be in union with God for all of eternity. This is why you were created. This is why he made you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Father Sean just texted me. He said it's Guide for Confessors. Nice. Is the name by, of the book. By St. Alphonsus Liguori. Yeah. So in, in this book, he... he but yes, back to oh, what sorry, you're saying. Yeah, like, sorry. Oh. We're less than 30 days. I mean, it's less. we've got less than a month. So like the finish line... Is, is approaching. When you're running a race, you don't slow down you like as you get closer to the finish line you actually like all right uh and yeah if if anybody's ever run like the 800 the 800 is like one of the the worst worst it's it's so bad i mean 300 hurdles are worse but are they are are they yeah but i never ran any i never ran any hurdles i didn't really do much running i'm just pretty slow i'm not all that fast on my feet but um i've run the 800 before and you, you're like by the time you come around you see the you know you're gonna die but it's time to give everything you got right mm-hmm. so it's, that's kind of where we are in lent right it's like you see the finish line and like just stick to, like this is the this is the time where you actually you can you see a lot of you can see a lot of fruits in your suffering because it's almost like there's layers that are being peeled back and you're understanding like oh well, am i actually deta- like attached to this unhealthily like Mm. In, a, in a disordered way or you know like and it takes a while for you to uh to, to come to that realization for that to actually expose itself right mm. and so yeah this is a a very important time during lent to recommit yourself even if you feel like ah, oh, my, my lent hasn't been that great it's not what i've been wanting or maybe excess 90 you kind of fallen off a little bit and you've given you've kind of relaxed some of the disciplines like this is the time to kind of kind of gird your loins and get back up on the saddle and like say like no i'm gonna finish strong mm-hmm. which is hard to do like once you kind of let let yourself you cut yourself some slack right it is hard to rein it in mm-hmm. you just have to like man up and mm-hmm. make this conscious act of the will i'm doing it like you, you need to like repent a little bit even though like exodus 90 is a voluntary program that you know right. it's not like oh you're committing sin by taking a hot shower but there is like you have to like do a mental exercise of repentance like i shouldn't have done it because i committed you know like i'm sorry for doing it i'm back on track and get back if, on. if you don't have that like repentance so to speak then th- you're not going to be able to rein it in you know you need to like mentally restore just- things yeah so anyway, so I thought like this is a this is a good opportunity to kind of talk about death. We've talked about uh, death on the show before, you know, talking mm-hmm. about how how you can't escape it. Uh, and then we also we've also talked about kind of like deathbed conversions not too long ago, and uh-huh. how you know you shouldn't yeah, wish. Yeah, Thomas Akempis, I think, hit 
what was that? That book also may have been, it was something very similar in title, like Preparations for Death, which is what we're reading today. Mm-hmm. Um, but honestly, Thomas Akempis' book is very, very similar to what the what we're going to be reading today here from Alphonsus Liguori, where kind of walking you through a hypothetical scenario of, hey, right. here's a man on his deathbed, you know, how does that apply to you? Yeah, so he, he takes into three considerations. So he takes three people into consideration that are, that are dying, right? A, a secular guy, basically, a Christian man who hasn't been living his faith well, and then a just man, namely like a Christian who's lived his life well, mm-hmm. and how they consider death at that moment of, hey, the time is up, you're about to die. Welcome back to the Catholic Man Show. Sipping on a little bit of this smoke wagon malted straight fry whiskey. And we're talking uh, about death. St. Al- Alphonsus Liguori has a book entitled Preparation for Death, Considerations on Eternal Truths. This is another reason why I think that if Alph- Alphonsus Liguori was here in today's world, like in, in the modern world, he would not be loved. He would not be <laughs> liked. Uh, because he he talks about these eternal truths and like I said he's pretty hard hitting he, he he like takes bold stances yeah and a lot of them would be considered probably uh, you know in this day and age uh, not as passionate not as compassionate maybe or maybe not as yeah uh, I don't know they're not yeah not less pastoral yeah maybe that's maybe that's the word I was thinking of but it's because he he desires to know like to to convey the truth to everybody because he desires and he, he hopes that everybody is saved, right? Yeah. And so, like, he yeah, wants- he's very blunt. He's not, he, and he doesn't lack charity Mm-mm. in his writing at all. So, again, so he considers three different people in, in the same scenario. The first one is uh, basically a sinner, namely like a, a, a secular person, non, non-Christian sinner. Then he talks about a Christian who has not really fulfilled his duties and vows as a Christian and as he has not taken his baptismal vows seriously or just the work of a Christian seriously within his life. And then he talks about a just man and they're all three on, you know, on the deathbed. So he has, so, so we'll start with the, uh, the death of the sinner, mm-hmm. the, the one who is not a Christian on his deathbed. We hear a lot of times, and we've talked about this before on the show Dave, that there, there are times where, where some people who say like, I'm religious, but not spiritual uh, or I, I'm I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual, mm-hmm. uh, and maybe you know when I get older, I'll I'll try to figure it out, and uh, you know uh, on my deathbed, try to look for loopholes and looking for loopholes, looking for loopholes, and so anyway, so he's so Alphonsus Liguori really combats this idea of of like mm-hmm. having a deathbed conversion or banking on a deathbed conversion. I thought his his points here were so strong. Yes. So he basically says, when you have news of death, the thought of being obliged to take, uh, to take and leave everything in this world, you have a remorse for, uh, of conscience. The time is lost, the, uh, of wanting to, the, the time at, at present, but you don't really have it any longer. The right of divine judgment, you know that a judgment's about to come up upon you. The unhappy eternity that awaits possibly you as a sinner, and all the things that uh, that form a horrible tempest, which will confuse the mind will increase his apprehensions and thus full of confusion and distress the dying sinner will pass to this other world so it's really interesting because he basically says because of all of the anxiety that you are, that you have because mm-hmm. you, you're on your deathbed you're realizing the judgment is about to come where you possibly are that it actually m- mentally confuses you and give or and gives you so much angst that you actually can't think clearly enough to actually know what to do. Yeah. And and we've seen this before, right? Like like or at least I've I've seen this in my own personal life, right? If, if there's a, a something that happens, like you get in a car wreck and you have not thought about like, hey, what should I do if I get in a car wreck? Mm-hmm. You get in a car wreck, your anxiety is going up, your your your, your blood is pumping, your, your your adrenaline's, you know, pumping through your veins and you're trying to figure out like what am I doing? Am I okay? Is this passenger okay? Is the other person okay? How damaged is my car? What like what do I need to do? And like right. you know, like from a just a 
a mental like from from just a normal like if i asked you today like hey what you do if you get in the car wreck you're like well you got to make sure everybody's okay and then you got to you find your insurance card and then you have to call the police Mm -hmm. and you have to write a report and like you you would know the steps to take but in that moment you're so bewildered and like uh confused that you actually don't know the steps to take because of the anxiety and, and the adrenaline sure very similar i would imagine would be this kind of same feelings that you would have on your deathbed. Yeah. and Maybe that's an analogy that, I mean. And I think a lot of people, I don't know if they're like actively planning, like on my deathbed, I'll convert. But I I think with, it's more something like, ah, you know what, I'll just get to that later. You Mm -hmm. know, like they probably intend to do it before they get to their deathbed, I hope. But the point that I thought he made here was that was like so strong and like this is just a natural this is just a natural reality it's not a supernatural thing but that is very likely on your deathbed your mind will be so weakened by the illness that you have maybe you're in a lot of pain and you're just not simply capable of even thinking about like assessing your life very well at that like what how what kind of mental capacities are you going to have? Right. Um, and if you can't have a moment of where I'm going to recognize the sins I've committed, I'm going to ask for, I'm, I'm going to be sorry for them. I'm going to repent and ask for forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Um, God is all merciful, but you know, he's been, he's, you've had a whole lifetime to repent. Yeah, you know, and you have squandered it, and and that's some of the anxiety that 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 happens, right? Is 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 and he? It's a thread that is wo- woven throughout all three of these uh, considerations. Uh, is that of time uh, wasted mm-hmm. that you have to be accounted for? Yeah, he say he talks about like, you know, you you have all these bad habits that you've you've built up. Right, these these vices that you've held on to and, and you've built, like you know, because habit is is uh, the, a virtue is a habit of doing the good over and over again. A vice is basically the habit of doing bad over and over again, right? Mm-hmm. And he says, like, to conquer bad habits, Saint Augustine had to fight uh, against them for twelve years before he was able to get out of the ruts of these vices. And he says, like, so what makes you think? That on your deathbed, or as you as you know that you're going to be dying, that you're going to be able to get out of these bad habits like that. Yeah, uh, which I found like to be very powerful. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, now, obviously, God can do anything He wants. Uh, he can give you supernatural grace that is uh, outside of, of of the norm. Right. Also, a very risky thing to be banking on. You can't bank on it. Right. So 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 he talks about like how the sinner will try to seek God at death, but he will not find Him. Because of this confusion in his mind. Mm-hmm. And then he talks about the anguish of the dying sinner. Right? That the dying man will be tempted, not by one, but by innumerable devils who will labor for his damnation. Mm-hmm. Right? So, uh, which, uh, he, when he talks about like all, all these vices and the thing, like this moment of death and like all these, the, the, the evil ones know that this is the moment that if I can get you to, to uh, despair at this moment, mm-hmm. I have you forever. Yeah. And people who have had near-death experiences, this seems to be a common thing that um, goes along with it. And that they actually, there are people who say that they've seen the demons come for them, you know, and, and that they they knew that they, that, that you belonged, that, this person belonged to them by right. You know, like yeah. it was like a legal contract. It's like, no, he committed these sins. He His soul belongs to me. You yeah. Know? And in they fact, came to us like. Listen to this. This is exactly, he says like, uh, this is like some of the demons. He says, we are your offspring. We will not leave you. We will accompany you to the other world and we'll present ourselves with you to the eternal judge. The dying man will then wish to shake off such enemies, but to get rid of them, he must detest them. He must return sincerely to God. His mind is darkened and his heart is hardened Mm -hmm. and he's not capable of doing so. This reminds me of uh, C.S. Lewis's The Lizard on the Shoulder. Yeah, it does. It's a lot like that. Uh, We actually have a... a, um, Dr. Kyle gave gave us that 
uh, to put it out for yeah. the studio. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I, from where I sit, I see it all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there's another book. Uh, this is a book that you and I both read a long time ago. Struck uh, by lightning. Struck by lightning. And um, the, in the very beginning is her death of this book. It's her. It's a true story that she recounts. And th- that was like something I think she does really well in the book is talk about how at her point in this life, because it was when she was much younger, she was distracted. Like her focus in her life was on looks, appearances, mm-hmm. vain glory. Like what kind of jewelry do I have on? And and she remembers dying on this hospital bed, worried that the nurse is going to steal my bracelet as soon as I die. Like that's what she was thinking about. Mm-hmm. Even knowing, like, she said that Jesus was in the room, like, wanting to talk to her. And he was, she was telling him, Jesus, hang on. She's going to steal my bracelet. Like, she's, uh, like, this, I need to figure out how to, like, about my bracelet. You know, and the point that she makes in the book, which I think is a similar point that Alphonsus is making, that Thomas Akempis makes in in his, his book as well, that if you have lived a life focusing on a certain thing and that is the thing that consumes your thoughts it consumes your energies it consumes like that's your the way you're you're focused and it's your goals or whatever yeah then what makes you think that at the last moment of your life you're not going to still be focused on those things if you think oh i'm just going to shake off the illusions that i have wedded myself to my entire life in that moment right then I won't care I'll about... I'll have a clear fa- I'll clear mind at I that won't point. care about yeah. my... Mo- I care about money now, but I won't care about money then, or I won't care about my appearance then. I won't, you know, whatever, fill in the blank. Then you're just fooling yourself. Yeah. The things that we... And the people that we m- turn ourselves into now, we're going to be that same person at that moment of our death. Yeah. And so if we don't make a habit of repentance, then we won't have that habit then. That's right. Yeah. So he talks about how, again, just to recap, the sinner goes to seek God at death, but he cannot find him. The anguish of the, the dying sinner. And the last one is we, uh, we must seek God when we can find him. So seek him when you have the opportunity. And when we, on the other side of the break, he makes this beautiful uh, little saying that I think is, is very apropos. So Wonderful. We'll be right back. Dude, you're getting so good at pushing my button. I also think so. <laughs> Welcome back to the Catholic Man Show. I'm David Niles here with Adam Minahan. We're talking about death. It is Lent. If you die before you die, then you won't die when you die. Yes, indeed. It is a good time to die. I try to die every day, a little bitty, just a little bit. Just a little bit, <laughs> not too much, <laughs> but every day. Okay, so yeah, so we're talking about, we're, we're giving three considerations, one being the secular man, one being kind of a, a non-practicing Christian, if you will, and then also a just man, right? Uh-huh. So we're almost done with the, the secular guy, the man. Uh, he does say this kind of give ends on a little bit of hope here. It gives a little bit of hope. He says, like, we must seek God when we can find him. Right, and so he says that it is true that whatsoever hour the sinner is converted, God promises to pardon him. So mm-hmm. he says, "Listen, totally. God's mercy is there for you. Yeah. So if you if you can, like if you have the mental capacity to, and it be doesn't, sorrowful, it only takes like just an like a one, like a like a movement of the will, like right. one tiny movement of the will. Boom." In the direction of repentance, that's right. God is so merciful, and he, you yeah. don't deserve it. You've like this. In this, pers- this person has lived, but in this situation especially, you've lived a terrible life up to the moment of your death. You've been a miserly, like, like terrible scoundrel, wo- scoundrel, terrible person, who didn't give a care about anything except yourself, his himself. And then at that last moment, 
if he has that act of the will in that direction of repentance, he can be he pro- saved. He can like, be saved. And God promises to pardon him. Yeah. But he does say, but he has not promised that sinners will be converted at death. On the contrary, he has often protested that they who live in sin shall die in sin. Yeah. And I think it can be a little scandalous, you know, to hear a saint especially say, for the people at their death who go looking for God, that that they won't find him. Right. I think it can be scandalous. It's not because God doesn't want to forgive them. But or it's not these, because these God's people, not there. These it's people, not because God's not there. Right. He's there. He wants you, he wants to forgive them, but these people don't know how to f- look for him. They don't know how to find him. They Again, sin makes you stupid. Right. And they look f- they look for him in things that are not him, mm-hmm. like vainglory, mm-hmm. appearances, money, you know. And so that's that's I, I just wanted to say that because it's not like God is like hiding from them. Right. That's exactly right. So he says, God, uh, at present, gives you this time. Thank him for it. And apply it, an immediate remedy, to the evil that you have done. So he's talking to this, so he's basically saying, uh, this guy who's on his deathbed, a secular man, if you're reading this right now, and you're not actually on your deathbed, but you're considering it, he says, like, listen, this is a gift from God right now, reading this, and coming to this realization. Thank God for this, and adopt by all means of finding yourself in the grace of God when death comes. For when there will be no more time to acquire his friendship, so he basically says, "Like, hey, listen, this is an opportunity for you right now." I love because here, here's what I love about Alphonse's glory and how you know that he is acting and writing upon in true charity is because he he makes very bold stances, right? But then he also says he kind of at the end gives you hope, which is different than a lot of people who are just trying to make outlandish claims just for the sake of the outlandish claim, right? Just mm-hmm. to kind of right. be popular for the sake of this bold claim. He makes these claims, but then at the end says like, no, there's hope. Thank God for this moment and capitalize on it. Seize, the, seize this moment. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was really cool at the very end. You know, he, he basically a, a, little, a little taste of evangelization at the very end there. Yeah, no, totally. So then he goes into the uh, next consideration. And he's talking about basically... Uh, a dying Christian who has been careless about the duties of religion and has thought but little of death. So this is, this is, I think, in my opinion, a lot of people. Yeah. Including myself a yeah, lot of I was, time. I was just thinking about myself. Um, and so this is, so he's talking a lot about the Christian who doesn't think about his death, has not taken his faith seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the first thing he talks about, his first point is that it's a sad state of the world, uh, worldling at death, of this person at death, because he has given, he's been given this gift, right, of of uh, of Christ, you know, yeah. in his church. Yeah, and he says, remembrance of a disorderly life he has until uh, that. Um, I'm sorry, remembrance of the disorderly life he has until then led, in spite of so many calls and lights from God, of so many a- a- admonish uh, admonitions. Ad, admonitions. Admi- admonitions, thank you, from spiritual fathers and of so many resolutions made but never executed or uh, afterward neglected. Now, that like hits home Sp- for me. Especially that last part. Yeah, that hits home for me so many times because I can't tell you how many times in my mind, like I'm headed to confession. I'm like, Lord, I, like I'm so sorry for my sins and as soon as I get out of confession, I'm going to do this and this and I'm going to just change, you know, change th- all these things and then I get out of confession and I'm just so thankful for his mercy and I do my penance and I'm going home and my like will is so weak. Yeah. Because all those things that I was like wanting the, you know, to do I I just don't do. Right. I it, they fade away. I I, I neglect them. Yeah. Um, when I was like, you know, after college, you and I both kind of came back to the faith and really like diving into it and loving it. And I remember getting to the point where I think like my will is pretty strong. <laughs> like I'm, I'm pretty good, you know, like, and now I just look back on that. And it's like, what an idiot, you know, like, yeah. cause now I've come to a, a much deeper knowledge of myself and I'll, I know that I am pathetic. Yeah. I mean, it is. You are. You it's, really are. Yeah. It's embarrassing. I know. It's hard for me. It's part of 
like my sanctification to have you as a best friend. You're and that's good. I'm glad I can I'm glad I can help somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know what I mean? Like without, no, totally. without God's grace, without basically him just doing all the work, mm-hmm. I will instantly fail. Oh, absolutely. Instantly. And it's like the things that you struggle with or that you have you struggled with in the past maybe and you don't struggle with anymore. Like you cannot think no. Um, oh, well, I have conquered this. No. You know, this will never be a problem again. Right. Um, because, like, the... Because it, you absolutely could do it again. Yeah. Uh, and so he, he's... Uh, he, so th- this Christian who, who is on his deathbed, he, he, he kind of talks to him and says, like, what would it have cost to have avoided such occasions of sin that you've committed? Like, broken off friendships? Um, having to frequent, like... Uh, confession mm-hmm. uh, avoided like inconveniences of your soul which is so important to do it's just like what would it have actually cost mm-hmm. and like really kind of plants the seed of like you know the things that are really like not good for you that are that you're holding on to right now whether it be friendships or certain vices uh gambling drinking pornography like whatever it yeah, is whatever it is what like what is it that, that you're holding on to that if you would have just cut yeah. that out of your life yeah, when I read this, it did strike me this there's exact that exact line that the things he mentioned, they actually are not nothing. I mean, like breaking off a friendship is hard. I mean, like actually he's listing things that have a big cost. Oh yeah. I mean, actually it's it seems like well that that would cost me a lot because if you're right now still living your life, not yet on your deathbed, right. you think like oh, I couldn't do that. Right. That would that would cost me too much. But then you I love the way he puts the context and then shows like, okay, well, now it's going to cost you a lot more. Yeah, but and I remember going through this like mental struggle after college because I had some really good friends, w- friends that I cared about uh-huh. and, and like really thought like we're going to be friends forever. Yeah. And I realized I can't like for my salvation's sake, I can't be friends with them. And I really love them. Like I care about them sure. and I want like I like them, you know, and I want to hang out with them. But I realized I cannot be a saint and hang out with this person. Because mm-hmm. it's not not because of them. It's just, I, I'm just so weak. Yeah. Because I can't, I cannot step up. I'm not a big enough man to step up. Mm-hmm. And I had to cut out those people. And that was hard, man. I remember calling Haley. You know, we were still dating. And, you know, I was like kind of pouring my heart out to her. Like coming to this realization that, hey, some of my friends that I've been best friends with for years I just don't like I, I no longer get to be friends with them mm-hmm. yep yeah I do do that too and it's really hard mm-hmm. but you have to but you have to do it and you might some people might say like well you're just you know you should try to be a good friend to them and like bring the faith to them or whatever and you just can't do that I mean I can't give what I don't have maybe I mean everybody there's different circumstances but Sometimes you just got to you got to get out. Maybe you can go back someday. Yeah, and some of these some of these friends I still text. Uh-huh. I still I, I still I it's not like I I've cut all contact off from them. Right. Right. But I just had to change my lifestyle. Mm-hmm. I've had to change what, you know, what. And I think that that has led me to the thing is is the Lord desires you and he's constantly going after you, desiring you to come to to him and calling him, you to him. And so if you cut out certain things in your life, what he's going to do is actually give you the necessary means for your salvation. Right. So what he's going to end up doing is he's going to like, you're going to end up actually finding other people in your, in your life that is actually going to grow in friendship with Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, but that's, that's not something to take lightly. I think it's very, it's, it's tough. Yeah. Okay. So the next one is desiring the, the worldly at death. Like, so this is kind of like what you're talking about. Um, even, even this last time, right, with uh, struck by lightning, the, the gal. Yeah, you know it says, uh, "How ardently shall we desire at death the time which we have now squandered away?" Again, another thread that he, he talks about. And uh, we're out of time on on Catholic Radio. Thank you to all our local Catholic radio stations that pick up the Catholic Mancho. If you are listening and have a Catholic radio station in your area, reach out to us. We provide our content for free. 
Uh, you can go check out the CatholicManshow.com. We have almost 400 episodes or more. We're on the Lord's team. The winning side. So raise your glass. Cheers to Jesus. But so he's talking about how, like, at, uh, like at death, the things that you've considered very important in your life, you know, up to this point, all, all these sudden, worldly, they're, they're you not. realize, oh, none of these things are actually important. Right. You, you're not taking any of them with you. You've like worked like all all the money you have, right? Or even like the clothes you're wearing at the time you die. Mm-hmm. You've worked so hard for all of this stuff, and it's just like, and now you're just dead. Mm-hmm. And like you're just getting, well, and and, you're, and in that moment, it's easy to look and see how it's like, why did I do that? Why did I spend so much time doing this on working on money? or stuff you know and now on your deathbed you see like pff, what a waste of time yeah he actually says during he says alas during this life these fools love their folly but at death they op- they open their eyes and confess that they've all been fools mm-hmm. and obviously like don't send us an email obviously you need money okay I'm not saying like don't work for money I think no. You know what I mean. But it's it's a disordered desire. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so he talks about how since then you now have to leave to avoid a, a death full of terror. Begin instantly to repair the past. Do not wait for that time in which you can make little preparation for judgment. Do not wait for another month nor another week. Perhaps this light which God in his mercy gives you now may be the light, the last light, and the last uh, call for you. So again, he's kind of like still ending on this like hope. He's like, listen, hey man, this could be it. Man, that's something to think about all the time. Like, because we will all have like a last a last light or a last call mm-hmm. from him in this life, mm-hmm. you know. And like maybe it won't even be on your deathbed, right? Because you may not even have a deathbed. You just might be walking down the sidewalk, right? And then you're squished on the sidewalk. By a giant meteor. Meteor. Bus. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Billboard. Maybe a billboard just like was, wasn't. Down. Maybe it wasn't put together right. Sewer drain. And a little breeze, and it just wormhole flattens you. Yeah. You don't even see so it many, coming. So many endless wormhole. Like that'd have to be a big worm. <laughs> uh, so the last point that he makes about this you know, kind of non-practicing Christian or one mm-hmm. that doesn't take seriously is the tardy regrets of the dying person. And, and what he means by that is, uh, he says, I could have had a, a led a life of happiness in the grace of God. And after so many years that he gave me, what do I find but torments, distrust, fears, remorse of conscience, and accounts to render? Mm. It's like in the screw tape, screw tape letters, like, you know, he, he comes to the realization that uh, I know I, I didn't do the things that I wanted to do, nor the things that uh, made me happy. You know, he, mm-hmm. he's like realized like this whole time I didn't do the things that I ought to do, nor the things that I should have done, or th- that I ought to do. to do or wanted to do. Yeah, yeah, and that's that is also the big thing that I think we need to do a better job with marketing or something that the Christian life actually will make you happy. It's the only way for you to be happy and it will be prof- it will it will give you profound deep happiness. Right? And because that, But that doesn't mean that it's not be suffering. It doesn't it, look like it. Right. From the outside you see these pious people going to church and you know like sometimes they don't look super happy. You look at some of the saints like even the ones we have like actual pictures of, mm-hmm. some of them look like a little, little, little grumpy, grumpy. Yeah, yeah, um, a little melancholic. Yeah, some of them do. <laughs> one of the one of the Fatima children, I forget which one, but like they just have like this scowl. It's a straight up scowl in yeah. this picture. It's pretty funny, but that's something that we need to just like have. Like you got the charisma. And you've got the why, you know, and like it get those things have to go together because people need to know that, that like that you are, I am happy. 
I'm happy because I'm a Christian. And that doesn't mean you're not going to have suffering. That's not going to mean like... No, but... Uh, you're actually even going to have... But you know what? You're going to have suffering whether you're a Christian or not. I right. Mean, you're not getting out of... You're not getting away from suffering. Right. But because I'm a Christian, now like the suffering doesn't bother me as much, you know? Right. Okay, so we've gone, we've gone over the secular person. We've gone over kind of the, the Christian who hasn't taken their faith seriously. And now to end on a, on a very positive note, he has a consideration of the death of the just. Um, and so he talks about the death of a just man is a rest. You know, that he may rest mm-hmm. in him. Uh, Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Uh, it's not a panic. It's like a... Yeah. It's like a, it's a reward. Right. Uh, it, yeah, he talks about how viewed according to the senses, death excites fear and terror, like we've talked about before. But he says, but viewed in the eyes of faith, it is consoling and desirable. Right? And so St. Ambrose actually, he quotes St. Ambrose here, and he says, uh, a present life is given us not to repo- not for repose, but that we may labor and by our, tour, it, our toils uh, merit eternal glory. You know, so we're made so that we may rest in him, mm-hmm. so that we may be truly leisurely in him for all of eternity. But right now, you know, God only gives us a certain amount of time to work to grow his, you know, to, to build his kingdom up. And as, as uh, Mother Angelica says, like, he's only giving you so much time. So get cracking. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's what she said, you know. Uh, she was hilarious. She was the best, yeah. Um, but he, he says, like, the saint is not afflicted at biding an eternal farewell to honors, for he always hated them and considered them to be what they really are smoke and vanity. He's not afflicted in leaving relatives, for he loved them only in God. And at death, he recommends them to his heavenly Father, who loves them even more than he does. And having a secure confidence in salvation, he expects to be better to be able to assist them from heaven than on earth. Like, to me, that was like, man, that that hits so hard, right? Totally. Because this is so hard to really think about as a father, as a husband, and as a father, right? Because you, you're... Like, imagine you're on your deathbed, you have your wife and your children, maybe your grandchildren, even maybe your great-grandchildren, you're all, they're all around you, and you're just like, I just want to be with them, and I, like, I love you guys, and mm-hmm. it's like, well, no, 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 you love them only in God. Like, that's what, that's what even, it's very biblical, right? Mm-hmm. You know, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that, that your love comes from God, and that, uh, uh, whoever says they, you know you have to hate your mother and hate your brother hate, hate your father and come follow me and follow me it's like well because you only love them you love them through and in God mm-hmm. and that it's just such a pride killer in my like in my thought you know thinking about it that oh like I can actually do more for them when I'm alive than it's when very I'm in heaven Obi Wan Kenobi esque mm, yeah you can't win Darth if you strike me down. I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Yeah, that's a, yeah. But um, I mean, it's so true that like a prayer of a righteous man is just. The prayer uh, availeth much. Availeth month much, and so if you're in heaven, you're going to be able to do a lot more for your family. Totally. Than here on earth. Yeah. Uh, so the second point he wants to say is that the death of a just uh, is a victory. Mm-hmm. Because it's like this is the end of man, right? This is like this is what you did it. You ran to you win did the it. race, right? Uh, and that like uh, he makes this very interesting point that to have this this very healthy distrust in self, and that once you die, it's like good. I no longer have the opportunity to disappoint or turn my back on yeah, God. I can trust myself again, <laughs> right? Um, which I think is very like interesting. Like, you know, it's, it's very like, true, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, at least at least in my experience. Yeah. Um, St. Catherine of Siena, Siena, when she was on her, like she was in her last moments, one of the last things she said is rejoice with me for I, for I quit this land in pains and go to a place of peace. Um, and so I think like, uh, what is, I think again, C.S. Lewis talks about this, like on the deathbed that like both the angels and like may like at your death, both the angels and the demons are rejoicing. The angels are rejoicing that you've won the race, and the demons have, are rejoicing that you're out of the war. Yeah, totally. Right. Hopefully, that's what's going on. Right. Yeah. Like that. 
I mean, th- hopefully the demons aren't rejoicing that like we got him. Well, the angels would not be rejoicing at that point either. Like, no, it, they it, it, it's both of them have to be right happening. Right, that that they're that the demons are, are grateful. Like, good, he they're out. He's out of the spiritual warfare. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, when Padre Pio died, how pumped were the de- demons? You know, the, or Saint John Vianney, or you know, some of these people like Saint Teresa of Lisieux. Like, how how pumped were the demons that? They are no longer in this spiritual... Like, Except, you know, to that last point, that now they're in heaven. And they need to do even more. And now they can do more, right. Right. Um, so the last one, we'll, just, we'll get to the, uh, this last and the third point that he talks about, is that the death of a just is the entrance into life. Mm-hmm. That uh, the death of a saint is called their birthday, because at death they are born to that life of bliss, which will never end. And that, you know, the death is is really... Like the, the what does Teresa of Lisieux say that like she's just, this is just a journey to to mm-hmm. the, the final destination right right, right. Uh, this is just the sh- the ship being sailed to 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 the final end yeah the saints are more alive than we are that's right yeah because because they're we, he, there with and, with God and God is a God of the living not of the dead right but you I mean God is the source of life and they're there like in union with Him right. And so again, so this they're is, full of life. This is why we, we you know, uh, this, we feast saints, uh, saints feast days are on their death, on their uh, yeah, the day of the death. In almost all, in most cases, in most cases, by far, is because like this is the day that they ex- that they probably entered into their eternal reward. Right, right. Um, and today is the day that you know my grandfather passed away. So again, please to keep him in your prayers because mm-hmm. maybe uh, God willing that you know uh, he is in heaven right now and and, and can uh, intercede for all of us. Dude, I can't wait to go to heaven. I think it's gonna be awesome. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it will be. But I, again, so I, like the reason why I wanted to talk about this tonight is because I I actually have can see like as I was reading this, I saw myself in all three of these men. Yeah, you know, there's the, like yeah. as I, like I there was not a point in time where I was reading you know the secular man, the the Christian man who's not taking his faith seriously, and the just man. There wasn't a point in time. where as I was reading it, I couldn't see at least a little bit of me in each in each man. Right, and that's the point. Right. Yeah, that you would see yourself in them because, yeah, we we have a little bit of all of these people. Mm-hmm. And hopefully, as you progress in the spiritual life, you're more and more the just man. But you'll you know, probably never not be the sinner. Right. I, I mean... I mean, God's grace is capable of perfecting man in this life. Mm-hmm. But... Um, doesn't mean that you won't sin. Statistically speaking, yeah, you can't get out of this. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, any any last concluding thoughts? Final thoughts? Just like stop sinning. Go to confession. Go to confession. Definitely, it's like it's Lent. Go to confession. Take your family to va- to, to to confession. Mm-hmm. If you want to be a good father, take your kids to confession with you. Exactly. We're on the Lord's team. The winning side. So raise your glass. And cheers to Jesus. Cheers.